Good morning, church family, and Merry Christmas. I am so thankful that you've chosen to take time out of your morning Christmas traditions to worship with us today. Your church staff has been hard at work over the past couple of months filming and preparing for this incredible service. And I hope that today, no matter where you are, sitting in your PJs on the couch, cuddled under your favorite blanket, sitting with your cup of coffee, that this service will be a special encouragement to you as we reflect on the gift that we've been given in Jesus and spend time worshiping together. And so let me invite you just to pray with us as we begin our service together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gift that you have given us in your Son, Jesus Christ. We are thankful, Lord, that we can gather in our homes together connected through the internet to be able to worship you this morning. And so, Father, we attune our hearts to you. We lift up our voices to you and we give you praise because you are so good. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, church family, let's worship together.
traditions as a family and something that I did when I was growing up is when before any of the presents are opened, uh, before we get out stockings or, or anything like that, uh, we celebrate Jesus' birthday. And we do that by making a cake and actually putting a birthday candle on the cake, singing happy birthday to Jesus, and just celebrating uh, that time together as a family. Our favorite family tradition is spending the night at Mimi and Grandpa's house and waking up on Christmas morning. Hello, Westgate. This is the True Family, and our favorite holiday tradition is Holiday Night at Greenfield Village. My favorite Christmas tradition every year is putting out the nativity that my dad made me. As you'll drive through our neighborhood, you'll see inflatables and Santa Clauses and snowmen and green and red lights, and then you get to our house, and this is what you see. Our favorite Christmas tradition is doing the Advent wreath and lighting the candles in the weeks leading up to Christmas, remembering Jesus coming as a baby and thinking about him coming again as king in the future. Our family tradition for Christmas for Steve and I for the 42 years that we've been married has been putting a crown of thorns on the top of our Christmas tree. My mom made it for us the very first year we were married. And even when we were missionaries in Germany 10 years ago, um, we actually made one while we were there and put it on the top of our tree uh, for our dorm so that our dorm daughters would be able to share what it represents for us. And that is, yes, we celebrate his birth, but the purpose of his birth was to come to sacrifice himself for our sins on the cross. And so the reminder of his birth is also the fact that he died for our sins and that's what brings us our salvation. And we just rejoice in that. So that is our family tradition. My favorite Christmas tradition is just how we spend our day. So I go to my parents Christmas morning and my dad makes breakfast. And I'm usually in some kind of Christmas pajamas. And um, after breakfast and everything is settled down, then I set up our presents where they go. I put my mom's in a certain spot and my dad's in a certain spot and put all my presents in a certain spot. And um, before we do anything, we pause and we pray. So first we light a candle and we say happy birthday Jesus. And then we all uh, pray together as a family and just try to remember what the real reason of Christmas is for that day. And after that, then we get to open presents, but we always wanna start our hearts with a thankful heart and just with remembering that this is about Jesus and what he did for us. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each in his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David. Which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. To be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger 
because there is no place for them in the inn. Let me tell you the story of this old rug. When I was a teenager, my grandparents were moving out of the house that they had lived in for probably about 40 years. And so after they had taken the few things that they needed for their new house, they let all of their kids come in and take the rest. And after they had done that, they let their grandkids come in and take anything else. And this is where I come in. And so I come in, we're all running around looking for what's left at our grandparents' house. And I run up the steps and at the top of the steps, there sits this old rug. Now, I don't know how long it had been there, but I knew I wanted it. And so I snatched it up, I grabbed it, it was mine. And it represented kind of my grandparents' house and all the feelings and memories I had there. And so I took it home with me and proudly put it in my bedroom. And then as I moved out of my parents' house, well, I took it with me there and put it at the front of our door. When I moved and went away to college in New York, well, it had to come. And it prominently was at the front of my dorm room. And then even as I got my first job and I moved to New Jersey, there it also was at the front. Well, I eventually get married. My wife looking at the old rug, well, she didn't love it quite as much as I did. And so we decided it could go back up into our bedroom on my side of the room, kind of half tucked under the bed, the other half sticking out. But if I'm honest, most of the time it had some old laundry on it and you couldn't really see it. And so there it sat for about 10 years until we moved back to Ohio. And as we're selling some items, getting rid of others, the old rug came up. What are we gonna do with it? Well, we have to take it, it's my old rug. And so I roll it up, wrap it up and put it in the, in the pod to move to Ohio. And as we got here and were able to buy a beautiful home, the question came, where is the old rug gonna be? Is it gonna go at the front? Is it gonna go by the couch? Well, there was just really no good spot for it. And in fact, it never got unwrapped but instead got tossed aside into the basement and there it sat for the next couple of years. Do you have an old rug? It might not be an old rug like mine, but maybe it's a piece of furniture or a keepsake that you've had for a long time that you love, that at one point maybe you even had it displayed prominently in your home. But over time, for whatever reason, it has now been put to the side. Maybe it's in a closet or a side room, or maybe it's been wrapped up and even put in the basement. If you're a kid, do you have that toy, that, that, that one that you had to have and it was so special, but now it sits on a shelf, it's collecting dust, or maybe it's even been kicked under your bed. Take a minute to think through, what is my old rug? And if there's people next to you, share what that is. Our Christmas story begins with Joseph and Mary being called for a census. This means that Joseph would have to travel to his hometown to be counted. And you could imagine with Mary so close to giving birth, this trip, this time that they have to travel, this wasn't ideal. They probably weren't looking forward to a multiple day journey back to their hometown. See, this wouldn't have been quick or easy. It wouldn't just be jumping in the car, packing a quick bag, and then no problem. No, this is maybe four or five days worth of a journey. And depending on the path they took, this could even be more days. See, the easiest way to get to Bethlehem from where they were would be go, to go through Samaria. 
Now the Samaritans and the Jews, Mary and Joseph, didn't get along. And so often what would happen would be that the Jews, as they traveled, they would go around Samaria. But this means that they would have probably even doubled their journey time. So instead of four to five days, it was probably more like eight, nine, or 10 days. And maybe you go, that's not that big of a deal. You know, a nice trip. I've seen pictures. Joseph is walking with his staff. He's holding the rope tied to the donkey. Mary's sitting on it, looking so peaceful with her little baby bump. But most likely, they didn't have a donkey. They were probably carrying the packs on their back. This would have been a hard journey, a windy path. It could have been dangerous with thieves and robbers looking for those that were traveling and even wild animals on the prowl. I say all this because by the time they get to Bethlehem, they are ready for a rest. Have you ever been on that long journey that when you finally get there, you're like, I'm just ready to sit back and relax. But when they get there, and Joseph goes and looks for a room for him and his wife, there's nothing available. And I could imagine him knocking on doors and begging and pleading, is there a space for us? Uh, we've been traveling for a week. My wife, she's about to give birth. There has to be a room for us, but nothing's available. And finally, there is a space, but it's not a nice room. Instead, it's the stable with the animals. And not like a big red barn like we would think of, but probably more like a cave, dirty and dark. And there the savior of the world is born. And he's placed in a manger, a feeding trough for animals. When I think about this story, I sometimes wonder if the innkeeper would have known who was at his doorstep, would it have changed things? If he would have truly understand that Emmanuel, God with us, was actually with them. He was right there. Would the story have looked different? But Jesus came and he didn't come with force. He didn't come demanding allegiance as a mighty king would. Instead, in humility, he was born as an infant. And in lowliness, he is placed in a manger, the feeding trough for animals. Do you have room for Jesus in your life? Or has he become like the old rug that's been moved around at your convenience? Maybe at one point he had prominence in your home, but now it's been dismissed to a closet, to a side room, to the basement. Or maybe you don't have room for him in your home at all, and he's been dismissed outside. But just like the Christmas story, Jesus doesn't force himself upon us, but instead he waits for you to invite him into your home and into your life. Oh
the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David. A Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest! And on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Merry Christmas, Westgate Chapel. I'm out here across from downtown Toledo by the Veterans Glass City uh, Skyway Bridge. And this bridge is a, uh, a feat of engineering. It is a fabulous, great structure. It's large, it's big. When it was completed in 2007, um, it was the largest project that the Ohio Department of Transportation ever completed. And it sits 130 feet uh, above the water, six lanes of traffic. Um, it dwarfs the, memorial, the Craig Memorial Bridge that it uh, replaced. Um, the biggest feature on this bridge that everyone sees is the glass-cased center column. And that center column has hundreds of LEDs inside of it that can make up millions upon millions of light color designs and combinations that can be seen from miles and miles away. Um, I love this bridge because oftentimes when we visit some extended family out in, in eastern Ohio, we come back late at night and I love coming across this bridge and seeing the different colors of light, seeing the different designs and seeing the skyline welcoming us back here to Toledo. But I often wonder, um, would those shepherds that we just heard about in Luke chapter 2, would they be impressed with this bridge as much as uh, I am? because we know that night they saw a lot of great things as well. They were out in the fields experiencing great darkness, great night as they were watching the, their sheep out in the, in the fields. And then suddenly an angel of the Lord um, with his glory of God shone around them, filling that air, filling that space with floods of light, just filling every, every nook and cranny, cranny with the, the, the light of God. And so then we understand it wasn't just the light, but it was also the glory of the Lord, the, the weight of God's holiness and his righteousness also filled that space. And then the scripture says they were greatly afraid, greatly terrified. And so would they have been impressed with this bridge? I'm not sure, because they still had more things to be impressed by that were great that night. We also read that then the angel speaks and says, don't be afraid. A common phrase that when God shows up, when Jesus shows up, he says, don't be afraid. And then gives him this message for, for tonight in the city of David, a savior has been born to you. Um, and then the good news of Christ the Lord. And it says this will bring what? Great joy uh, to all the people. A message of great joy. And this word before joy, great, is the same that describes uh, the fear that they experience on the same level of the joy that this message brings, of great joy. How awesome, how wonderful. And then so they were experiencing this great joy of the Lord in this message that the Messiah has come, that Jesus has come, and they can go see him wrapped in strips of cloth, lying in a manger, that Jesus has come. And Jesus has come to end the curse from Genesis 3. Jesus has come to live a perfect, sinless life as fully God and fully man. Jesus came to die as a sacrifice in our place upon the cross. Jesus came to conquer death through his resurrection. And Jesus came to bring us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his marvelous light. And so would the shepherds have been impressed by this? Probably not. 
God still wasn't done. If the one angel of the Lord visiting, the message of great joy, if that wasn't enough, God then sends an exclamation point. He sends the whole choir. He sends the whole choir of angels down, and they sing out the song of uh, glory to God in the highest heaven, uh, peace on earth to those on whom his favor rests. And this is the message. This is the message of Christmas, of great joy. And the shepherds rejoiced. I often wonder myself, am I more impressed with human effort, what humans can build, what we can do, what we can accomplish, than with the greatness of God? What with the, the greatness of the joy that this message of good news brings? I think the shepherds wouldn't have been impressed with this because they were so um, impassioned with the greatness of Jesus Christ coming at Christmas. There is a PS to this story. When this bridge was designed, it was made to last 100 years. Right now, it's already 15 years old, so 85 more years of this bridge that we think is so great, we know it'll soon be replaced. But we know the greatness of God, the great joy of his kingdom, which is everlasting, will go on forever, will never be replaced. And do we worship that? Do we celebrate that on this Christmas morning? So I would encourage you to spend some time today or tomorrow or sometime this Christmas week to share maybe a time when you have experienced this greatness of God, this great joy of Jesus Christ coming at Christmas. And as you do, I hope that brings and reminds you of the great joy of Jesus. Merry Christmas.
Jesus ring to the newborn King. Peace on earth, He with us, joy awakening at Your feet. We shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to see Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at them. The shepherds told them, but Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. Football is such an exciting sport, especially those games that go down to the wire. You know the ones I'm talking about. Clock's winding down and the offense has to score the touchdown and the defense has to do everything they can to stop the offense from scoring the touchdown. The crowd's going wild, the people are standing and jumping, they can't take their eyes off the game. And then there's people that are sitting at the edge of their seat. They're holding their breath, their body's tense, and their eyes are closed, waiting for the play to be over. And the clock starts to wind. Three, two, one. And whatever happens after that moment is going to be talked about for the next week, the next month. And if you're anything like me, there's moments I'm still talking about because of how epic the ending of the game was. But it doesn't have to be football. Pick your sport. Baseball, tennis, lacrosse, curling, or no sport. That's okay. But there's moments in our life that impact us. And after that, we're never the same again. Things we experience that it's too good to keep in and we want to share with the people around us even if we know them or not. Like your son playing the football game last Friday night, the catch or tackle that he made. The movie you want to share with people because its, it's storyline was incredible and the soundtrack was amazing. Or that pumpkin spice latte from Rustvelt that's mm, so good and you need people to try it. There's all these things that we need and want and have to share with the people around us. But they're fleeting, they're temporary, 
and they pale in comparison to what these lowly shepherds experienced. These unimportant, bottom-class citizens were met by angels. And the thing is, that's not even the best part of the story. What happened after that would change their life forever. It wasn't the ending of some crazy football game. It was a birth. The start of something that would change the world. And so these shepherds, they had to check it out, right? And which is pretty reckless if you think about it. They didn't have these babysitters for the sheep that they could just call up, right? They, they could have easily said, I want to. It'd be a really cool thing to go see, but I can't leave these sheep. It's my responsibility. It'd be irresponsible to leave them here unattended. But what do we see them do? Just like the fishermen left their boats and left their nets and the, the tax collectors, they left their booth and their money. They seek after the Savior because in that moment, nothing seemed more important. Not their reputation, not their livelihood, not their job, which is mind blowing because that's really all these shepherds had. Like that is their identity, is what they do. They're shepherds, but we see that they have this urgency to go. And also this trust that if they do go, that God is going to take care of their flock. He'll take care of the rest. And so we see that they seek. And I love to think about the moment in between from meeting these angels and then going to meet the Savior, Jesus. What, what was going through their minds? What were they thinking? What were they talking about? I couldn't imagine the conversations and the feelings. Like, did we really see that? Did the Savior really come? Like, did we drink too much sheep's milk? Like, what is going on? Then they see the barn and they step through that door and they see exactly what the angels said they would. A baby wrapped in clothes, lying in a manger. And there was no crowd, there was no noise, cowbells, air horns, there was no wild atmosphere. It was a still, beautiful moment and their lives were changed. And after that, they walked out the doors, they went back to the sheep, back to the fields, and they lived as if none of it had happened. Absolutely not. If you listen to the story and if you read it yourself, you know that after they had seen the baby Jesus, they have to go and tell everyone about him, that he's going to be the savior for all people. They couldn't keep it for themselves. It was too good to keep in. They had to go and to share. And they went throughout their whole town and told people. And everyone thought it was wild and wonderful. And so believers, followers of Jesus in 2022, is this your reaction to Jesus? Is this your reaction to the Savior's birth, to the gospel? That once you meet him, that once you experience him, that you're never gonna be the same again. And without a second thought or a second guess, you go out and you tell everyone about it too because it's too good to keep in. I don't know who you have to tell, but I know as you're sitting there on your couch this Christmas morning that you do. And if you don't, go and talk to God about it because I guarantee you he'll show you who needs to hear about him. Are you willing to go? and share Jesus with those around you and trust that God will take care of the rest. Just like he took care of that flock while the shepherds were gone. And I know there might be some worry and doubt and fear that's looming up inside because of that's scary and that's putting myself out there. But can I tell you that they might be real, these fears and these worries, but they don't matter because the God of the universe is saying, go and I will be with you in it. I'll be with you to the end of the age. So who does Jesus want you to tell about him? The clock's winding down. Are you going to make the play? Are you going to make the play that's going to change someone's life, not only for a moment or a week or a year, but for the rest of their life and for the rest of their eternity? Will you make the play? Because they must no.
to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, for that a man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angel 
As we close our time of worshiping together this morning, I wanna draw you back to Pastor Steve's first question. Do you have room in your life for Jesus? You know, when you think about it, that really is the culminating question of the entire Bible. Think about it. If we go back all the way to the Garden of Eden, when we think about God creating the world and creating man and woman, it tells us that, that we, human beings, were created by God in a perfect relationship with Him. And yet you know the story. It says that man and woman, Adam and Eve, made a decision that they would try to find a better way and to have a better life outside of God's plan for them. And in so doing, they broke away from God's plan. And the Bible tells us that at that moment, sin entered the world. The Apostle Paul says it this way in Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Not just Adam and Eve, but because of their sin, sin has come to all men and we find ourselves in a precarious situation. The Apostle Paul continues just a few chapters later and says in Romans 6.23, that the wages of sin is death. In other words, the position that we find ourselves in is one of separation from God and one in which the Bible tells us that because of our sin and because of, we will find ourselves separated from God for all of eternity, a punishment that we can never do away with. But the beauty is that the story doesn't end there. The Apostle Paul continues, he says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. You see, we gather together this morning and we worship because we are celebrating the fact that God loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus into this world as a tiny baby to live, but also to die, to take our punishment so that we could be restored in a right relationship with God. It says it this way in the book of John, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world would be saved. He didn't send Jesus into the world to make you feel worse about yourself, to make you sit and just look at your own sin and go, I could never match up. It says that he loved you so much, he sent his son Jesus to save you. And that is what we celebrate together this morning. But it also ultimately brings us back to that question. Do you have room in your life for Jesus? And this morning, maybe you've never put your faith in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. And as you've reflected on the Christmas story in the incredible gift that God offers to you in Jesus, if you find yourself there today saying, you know what, I wanna trust my life to Jesus. I wanna commit my life to him. I want you to have that opportunity right now. If you would like to make that decision and commitment, I would just invite you to bow your head and to pray this very short prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for loving me so much that you would send your son into this world to be my savior. I confess to you that I'm a sinner. I confess to you that for a time in my life I have rejected you, but I confess to you now that I believe in you. I believe that you love me so much. You sent your son Jesus into this world to die and to be raised again, so that if I put my faith in you, that I can have a right relationship with you and live with you forever. Today, Father, I commit my heart to you. Not only do I believe, but I commit to follow you and to love you with all that I am every day of my life. I thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. I want you to know that if you prayed that prayer this morning, there's nothing magical about that prayer, but it is a commitment of your heart to Jesus that makes all the difference. You are saved by your faith, and by your faith you can know that Jesus deeply loves you and that you have been welcomed into the family of God. But church family, I know that there are others that are out there this morning that really need to wrestle with that question of, do I have room in my life for Jesus? Maybe you've committed your life to the Lord before. 
Maybe you've been a Christian for a number of years, but you've recognized with the busyness of life and all of the things that can distract, Jesus has kind of taken just that little side part of your life. Maybe he isn't primary in your own heart. And I want you to have that opportunity this morning as well to commit yourself to him and to say, you know what? I desire to commit all of I, all that I am to him and to have him truly be the center point of my life. As well as we remember back to Pastor Dan's question to us this morning is, hey, will we go out and share the good news of Jesus with other people? People must know. And so, do you have room in your life as well to share the good news of Jesus with others? Let's commit ourselves together this morning as we close in worship, reflecting on all that God has done in sending Jesus into this world and commit ourselves to not only living for him and giving him that primary place in our life, but making the priority of going and telling everyone of this good news. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the time that we have had to worship together today. Lord, we pray that as we have gone through the scripture together, as we have sung songs of worship to you, as our hearts have been moved by your Holy Spirit, we ask, Father, that, that you would do an incredible and new work in us, not only today, but especially as we move into this new year together. Give us a heart, Father, that is fully devoted to you. We give ourselves to you. And Father, as well, we commit ourselves to the mission that you have given us to go and to tell others of your son, Jesus Christ, people must know. And so Father, take that seed that you have planted in our heart, the good work that you have done in bringing us to salvation, and Father, cause to come from that a passion for telling others about the salvation that they can receive in your son, Jesus Christ. So Father, we love you and we thank you and we give this day to you. It's in his name that we pray, amen. Church family, thank you for taking the time to worship with us today. I pray that this has been a special time for you. So be on behalf of our church family, our staff, Merry Christmas.